In this video, I'm going to talk about another application of entropy. Uh, it's a result called Bregman's theorem, which concerns a notion um, called the, perman <coughs> the permanent of a matrix. And so I'll just say what the permanent of a matrix is first, and then we'll I'll talk about what the theorem is. So um, the permanent is basically the determinant, except that you don't worry about those annoying signs with even and odd permutations. So we can write it, I can write a formula. If A is um, an n by n matrix, then um, its permanent is the sum over all permutations sigma of um, the product i equals one to n of a i sigma i. So the difference with this and the determinant is we haven't got this sign of sigma out here. Now the determinant's got all sorts of nice linear algebraic properties that make it um, quite nice to calculate. Um, in particular, you can calculate it in polynomial time. The permanent's absolutely not like that. Um, and uh, it turns out to be, it's not just uh, that it seems to be hard to calculate, but there are actually theoretical results to that effect. There's a famous result due to Leslie Valiant, who showed that it's something called number P complete, which roughly speaking means um, that it's at least as hard as a whole class of counting problems, which include problems in um, NP. So it's number P complete, it's even harder than NP complete. Um, but uh, so that might make you think, well, if, if it's incredibly hard to calculate and it's sort of not got those nice linear algebraic properties, is it a natural concept? So to try to convince you that it's got at least some naturalness, um, let's consider what happens if A is an, a, a zero one matrix. So entries are all zeros and ones. So then we can think of it as the adjacency matrix of a bipartite graph. So I have two sets, um, X and Y, of size N. Um, uh, as I say, we, we, we think of it as the adjacency matrix of a graph G with vertex sets X and Y of size N. So I set um, AXY equals one if XY is an edge and naught otherwise. That's what I mean by the bipartite adjacency matrix. We've had this point earlier in the course. And this is counting something. It's counting over all sigma. So that's all permutations. Uh, so actually, I, I think I'll make um, X and Y for convenience be copies of the integers from one to N. So now I can talk about permutations of, of one to N. Uh, so if I've got um, some vertices down here and some vertices up here, I've got them here I've written six of them. Now I've got some permutation of those. So uh, say this goes to this, 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 and this goes to this, for example. Um, so when will that permutation contribute one to this sum of products? It'll do it only if we got, so here's vertices one, two, three, four, five, six. This is uh, X down here and Y is up here. So that's sigma one and that's sigma two and that's sigma three and so on, sigma four, sigma five, sigma six. Um, so we need, so all these AI sigma i's are gonna be either one or zero and for, to contribute to the product, you need them all to be ones. So in other words, you need all these things to be edges. So in other words, you need the permutation sigma to define for you a perfect matching. So perfect matching, just to re remind you if you, I'm sure you, you know, but just to remind you, it's a, a collection of edges such that um, a collection of n edges such that uh, each vertex here is joined by one of those edges to a vertex downstairs and each vertex downstairs is joined to one upstairs and so we say that those two vertices are matched to each other. 
So um, what that tells us is that if A is a zero one matrix, then the permanent of A is just counting the perfect matchings. Uh, and actually that's how I'm going to think about it because I'm going to prove Bregman's theorem is a result about permanence of zero one matrices. And so um, actually I find it more convenient to forget talking about matrices and talk about perfect matchings. But let me just state what the theorem says. Um, let, uh, I'll state it in terms of matrices. So let uh, A be um, a zero one matrix or an N by N zero one matrix um, with RI ones in row I for each I. And it gives us an upper bound for the permanent. The permanent of A is less than or equal to the product I equals one to N of RI factorial to the one over RI. And if you want to get some sort of rough idea of what this right hand side is, uh, we just go back to the approximations that we talked about um, earlier in the course. So RI factorial I think of as RI over E to the RI. And so this will work out as, so when you raise to the power of one over RI, it just cancels out this RI. So you get um, basically sort of twiddles and sort of broadly speaking, it's like E to the minus N times the product I equals one to N. All right. But uh, this is more exact in certain situations. So let's just consider, for example, uh, a very special case. So if uh, just to show that this can be sharp. So if A is entirely one, then the permanent of A is easy to calculate because every single permutation contributes one and there are n factorial of them so we get n factorial but let's see what this formula gives us it gives us the product i equals one to n of n factorial because now there are n ones in each row raised to the power of one over n and that is of course just n factorial because we've multiplied this thing n times so um it's sharp in that case and also a nice simple thing to see is that if you ever have a matrix that's like this, A, B, 0, 0, a sort of block matrix, um, the permanent of this thing here is the permanent of A times the permanent of B. But also this expression here for, for the whole matrix is this expression for the first few rows times this expression for the last few rows. Uh, so we also get that these things multiply. Um, so if I call that sort of F of A, then I'll get that F of this matrix is F of A times F of B. So that tells us that any matrix that's made out of a sort of a whole bunch of blocks, um, by induction it tells us that it's made up of a whole block bunch of blocks of ones, um, and zeros everywhere else. Uh, for such a matrix, uh, Bregman's theorem will be sharp. Right, so now let us think about how we're going to prove it. Um, and before I do that, I will just restate it in terms of perfect matchings. So equivalently, if uh, G is a bipartite graph with vertex sets x, y um, of the same size. I don't think I need to say that they have size n, but I, I reserve the right to do so. Uh, then the number of perfect matchings in G is 
is at most um, the product over all vertices in x of the degree of x factorial raised to the power 1 over the degree of x. So why is that true? It's because the number of perfect matchings in G is just the permanent of the bipartite adjacency matrix, and the number of entries in the row corresponding to x is the degree of x. So I've written dx for the degree of x. And so we get this is this ri factorial to the 1 over ri. Okay, um, so just before I get on to the proof, let me just comment that uh, the precise problem that um, Leslie Valiant showed was in number P, was number P complete, um, I think is the problem of counting perfect matchings. Um, so there is no polynomial time algorithm that will, for an n-vertex graph, will tell you um, how many perfect matchings it's got. And in fact, even approximating is hard. Although there is something very famously that you can do now, which is um, there are algorithms around that will approximate the, num the, the permanent of a matrix or the number of perfect matchings in a bipartite graph with high probability. So if you say, I want to be 99% um, sort of sure um, that of what the permanent is to within 1%, there are algorithms that will do that efficiently. Um, but that's called prob probably approximately correct. This is a sort of buzz phrase there. Uh, so now, that's, but that's a, a completely different topic. So let's go back to Bregman's theorem. So what are we going to do? How are we going to use entropy here? Well, there's a sort of obvious answer to that, or an obvious part of the answer. And then there's also a really very, very nice uh, trick. I should say that the proof here is not Bregman's, and I've stupidly forgotten um, who it is, but it's in the notes, um, the person who's responsible for this lovely uh, entropy argument. So um, the sort of obvious idea is we'll say, um, we'll just define ourselves a nice random variable, and it's going to be, uh, so unlike in the, um, where we were counting P3s in a bipartite graph where we chose some funny distribution, here we're just going all out and say, let uh, sigma, be a random matching. Um, and let's just say a random, so it's basically a random matching, but I'm going to say a random function from x to y that determines a matching. So by that I mean it's a function from x to y, and it has a property that x is always joined to sigma x. Um, so, and when I say random, I really mean it's chosen uniformly. So, if we can work out the entropy of sigma, or at least get a, an upper bound for the entropy of sigma, that'll translate directly into an upper bound for um, the number of matchings from x to y, because I've chosen one uniformly. So if we, we've got the entropy, we'll just take um, two to the that, and then we'll, we'll have the uh, desired upper bound for the number of matchings. So we would like to calculate, or we would like to bound sigma. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, sorry, I said bound sigma, I don't mean that, of course. I mean bound the entropy of sigma. So let x1 up to x, oh, I'm, I'm going to have to say what uh, the size of x and y is. So x1 up to xn be um, an enumeration of the elements of x. <clears throat> and now let's apply the chain rule to this. Um, so first of all, we will observe that uh, sigma is entirely determined by what sigma x1 is, what sigma x2 is, and so on up to sigma xn. So perhaps I'll write that. So sigma is determined 
by sigma x1 up to sigma xn. So I'll write that. So we've got a random variable here. Um, and of course, things are slightly difficult because uh, these things are not uniformly distributed, they're not independent or, or anything like that. And uh, sort of how sigma xi is uh, distributed depends in a very complicated way on how the other variables are distributed. And that's part of what makes this thing look kind of difficult, but that's going to be a trick to get around a lot of this difficulty. But anyway, we've got this and we can at least just write down what the chain rule says. So H sigma. So, so by invariance, I'm going to say sigma just is this um, random variable here. So H sigma is um, H of sigma x1 plus H of sigma x2 given sigma x1 plus and so on all the way up to H of sigma xn given sigma x1 up to sigma x n minus one and I've just got space for that. So um, that's I haven't done anything really except just write down what the chain rule says and got a fairly horrendous looking expression but um, let's just think a little bit about um, what this is and make it just a bit more explicit. So what is the entropy of x1? Um, I'm just going to introduce some notation. So we'll write uh, nxi for the neighborhood of xi in y. Right, just the neighborhood of xi. So the degree of xi is the size of the neighborhood of xi. So h of sigma x1 um, is just uh, the log of the size of nx1, which I could write as, well, here I will, but uh, this is not going to be so easy in a moment. So it's the log of the degree of x1, and logs are still to base 2. Now what about h of sigma x2? Um, given sigma x1. Um, well, it's going to be the log of, now, what, if we know what sigma x1 is, oh, sorry, I've, I've, I've just said something that's not quite true, but uh, we can correct it very, very easily. So we don't know that sigma x1 is uniformly distributed amongst all its neighbors. But we do know that we're looking for an upper bound. So it's no that this entropy is no bigger than it would be if it were uniformly distributed amongst its neighbors. That's what I meant to say before. And similarly, this is going to be a, an inequality, not, a, not an equality. So what do we know about uh, the distribution of sigma x2? Not all that much, but we do know that it's not allowed to equal sigma x1. So it's definitely at most the log of the size of the set nx2 take away sigma x1. And in general, um, we get that uh, h of sigma xr given sigma x1 up to sigma xr minus 1. So that's what a general term from this uh, big sum here looks like. That's going to be less than or equal to log of the size of n of xr, not including sigma x1 up to sigma x r minus 1. So just to re repeat what I'm saying here, um, what do we know about sigma x r? We know that it's got to be a neighbor of x r, so it's got to lie in this set here, and it cannot be one of sigma x1 up to sigma x r minus 1, so it can't be any of those set, uh, those elements of y, so it must lie in this set difference here. Unfortunately, these things look um, 
kind of hard to uh, calculate as well. But now comes the really clever idea, which is we'll do two things. We'll fix sigma, which seems odd because we're um, trying to work out its entropy. Um, so we'll fix whatever sig what the permutation sigma is and average over all possible enumerations x1 up to xn. Okay, so for, for any given sigma, uh, we're going to treat this sort of expression here, or actually in particular the right-hand side, as a random variable that depends on the particular enumeration x1 up to xn. So it'd be some permutation of the elements of x, giving me my x1 up to xn. So what is, this is a question we have to ask, what is um, the expectation of log of n of xr take away sigma x1 up to sigma xr minus 1. And the slightly miraculous thing is that although this looks unpleasant, it turns out not to be unpleasant. This is actually not such a hard thing to, to work out. So let's think about it. Um, we want to work out, we want to sort of know uh, what the probability is that this set will have various different sizes in order to work out the distribution or in order to work out the expectation of the log. So let's just draw a little picture. Uh, let's consider for each vertex, actually, I'm not going to, this is not quite what I'm going to do. Um, what I want to do is the following. I want to say, Each vertex x um, occurs as xr uh, once in the uh, sum. So the sum that I'm talking about is the sum of all these terms on the right hand side. So just to say by the, 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 the chain rule we had, <coughs> this thing here, and then I've replaced all these terms here by upper bounds that I've obtained in this way. Um, and so each x, when we take our random um, enumeration, will be one of these xrs. So actually the real question is, uh, so what is, expected uh, actually I think I'll just even just cross this out because it's actually slightly misleading the real question is what is the expected contribution of the x term by the x term I mean the one where x occurs as the uh, thing that you take the neighborhood of so uh, as the, the expected contribution of the x term to the sum. And that's the thing that we can calculate. And um, so let's just think about what happens when we get to the x term. So we've got at that point, uh, we have some xr that equals x. And then we're interested in the log of n of xr take away um, sigma x1 up to sigma xr minus 1. And it'll be different xrs for different enumerations. So let's just draw a picture of x. We've got a bunch of neighbors. Now here's the point where we've fixed sigma. So one of these neighbors is sigma of x. And let's just draw these other ones will have inverse images under sigma. And so let's suppose we've got sort of uh, 
I call it U1, U2, U3, up to UK. So the U1 up to UK are just, uh, and K equals the degree of X minus one. Uh, so these are just the other things that are joined to neighbors of X by sigma. Now, um, when we get to X, what we will get here is just the number of neighbors that we've got minus the number of neighbors that we've already removed from things in the, in the enumeration. So when we take a random enumeration, some of these UIs will appear before X and some of them will come after X. And we're just interested. And so if, for example, X comes first, then we've got DX things to choose from. If it comes second, we've got uh, DX minus one things to choose from. And if, and if it's the uh, DX one, we've only got one thing to choose from. But notice that the position that X is going to come in the ordering of X and U1 up to UK here is uh, uniformly distributed amongst the K plus one or the DX possible orderings. So that tells us that uh, um, that the size of N XR take away sigma x1 up to sigma x uh, r minus one. So most of sigma x1 up to sigma, sigma x r minus one, we don't really care about. It's just the ones that happen to be amongst these, uh, where the xi's happen to be amongst these uj's. Uh, that is uniformly distributed in the set one, two, dx. It's a slightly subtle point, so I think I'm going to say it once more. So we've got a random ordering and I, the u1 up to u2, uh, u1 up to uk do not depend at all on the ordering uh, and, or, and x we've just chosen. So x u1 up to uk, I could think of maybe, maybe nicer to write x is u0 or something, but uh, they're determined as follows. x I just picked uh, and then I took the neighbors of X and then I took the inverse images under sigma of those neighbors. And then when I want to work out the distribution of the size of this set, all I care about, as I say, is where X comes in the ordering relative to U1 up to UK. Is it in the first place, the second place, all the, all the way up to the, the kth place? And if it's in the first place, I get DX choices. If it's in the second place, I get DX minus one choices and it's um, uniformly distributed. So what is the expectation? It's just um, one over dx sum um, little letter s equals one to dx of log of s. And that is uh, one over dx times log of the x factorial. Something rather promising is coming out. Um, so that was the contribution from x to the sum of all these upper bounds. And so the entire sum is going to be, or it's, it's the entire upper bound is going to be the sum over all x of one over dx log dx factorial. And remember that, now, what have we just shown? We've shown that for each sigma, um, the sum of all these things here um, is on average at most this. So now average over all sigma to produce that h of sigma is less than or equal to the same upper bound. There was something really slightly unexpected here that we, we worked out as an upper bound 
or we worked out um, an average for the uh, upper bound for a sort of for a fixed sigma, and then that turned out not to depend on sigma, even though these entropies will. Do, I mean, these entropies don't even make sense of, uh, um, if you fix sigma. But the, the, the right hand side does make sense if you fix sigma. Uh, so we then got a, an upper bound on average, and uh, so then we just took the average over all sigma and uh, we get this upper bound but uh, that tells us again this is log to the base two um, so that tells us that the number of perfect matchings is less than or equal to two to the this which is precisely uh, the product over all x of what of dx factorial the one over dx, i.e. what it was supposed to be. Um, I don't know whether I have anything much more to say about that except uh, that it may take a little bit of thinking about just to get really comfortable with this argument, but uh, um, it really is a very, very nice idea. Uh, maybe another comment I could make is that um, Although I've started using logs and things like that, um, I haven't really used all that much of the formula for entropy. I've just used the fact that the entropy of a uniform distribution on a set of size n um, is, well, um, actually perhaps I haven't, I haven't even used that. I've used the fact that the entropy of a random variable on a set of size n is at most log n. I think that's pretty much what I've used. Uh, so not very much of a numerical thing. And it's inevitable that we'd have to use some numerical aspects of the of entropy just because if you look at what the statement is in the first place it involves some numbers so we've got to get some numbers out somewhere so i think this is sort of pretty close to being uh it's not not exactly an axiomatic argument but it's pretty close to uh yeah, it's not not using very much from the formula okay i will finish at that point and um the next lecture will concern something called Shearer's lemma, which is also connected with entropy and which leads to a number of other very nice combinatorial applications. <laughs>